Steve Jobs was a visionary, a mind and a personality that almost through sheer will put Apple on the map and solidified its legacy. He wanted what's best for Apple by doing what he believed was best for consumers. And that is why he hand-picked Tim Cook to be CEO. Because Tim Cook is what's best for Apple, and Apple is better off without Steve Jobs. Great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a, they're done by a team of people. Today, I wanna to talk about the new direction of Apple. I'm more excited about them now than I have been in years. By now, you're caught up. You know about the new iPhones, the iPhone 11, the new normal, and the iPhones 11 Pro and 11 Pro Max. You might consider them to be the most boring iPhones in a long time, but I would argue that they're actually the most exciting iPhones in years. See, tech quote unquote enthusiasts get too caught up in being reactionary and they get their butthole all puckered up over pixels and gigawatts. It's like nothing exists until it's absolutely right in front of you. And if it's not in your line of sight, you cannot comprehend it. But unlike the YouTube comment sections, business is not reactionary and Apple is playing the long game. What we see, what we're witnessing right now from Apple is a transitional period. It's a transition from the old Apple to the new. This is Apple after the iPhone. iPhone sales have been declining year over year, and that's happening for a few reasons. Number one, it's happening to the majority of the smartphone market anyway, but number two, Apple was resisting reality. Though a lot might say that they just haven't been the same since Steve Jobs, I would argue that they've actually been stuck trying to maintain what Steve left behind. They've been stuck in their old ways, treading water and failing to adapt. Yeah, Tim Cook changed a lot about the company, but I believe Tim Cook was trying to make as much money as he could with Steve Jobs' company. Now, we're about to watch it finally become Tim Cook's company. The neatest thing that happens is when you get a core group of, uh, you know, 10 great people, that it becomes self-policing as to who they let into that group. So I consider the most important job of someone uh, like myself is recruiting. If Steve was still around, his stubborn nature would probably still leave us with just one new iPhone every year because he wanted to teach the world what they needed. And that worked really well when there weren't so many other brands running parallel with Apple. The entire industry is different. There are no longer just alternatives to the iPhone. There are straight up other options, other options that a lot of people choose, and there's legit competition. Apple is feeling pressure that they've never felt before. The Tim Cook Apple that we see now is doing less and less of trying to force and teach the world, and instead, finally starting to listen and learn from the world around them and they are adapting so that they can continue to try to be a part of it. More products, more options, more entry points into the Apple ecosystem. More money. I mean, Steve was so stubborn that he didn't get treatment for his cancer right away. He thought like juice and good vibes would help it go away. And if Steve Jobs was stubborn enough to kill Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs was stubborn enough to eventually kill Apple too. Let's face it, Apple has a nearly $1 trillion market cap. And you may not know this, but two thirds of all of that money came under Tim Cook's leadership, came after Steve Jobs. And you're probably saying, hey, it's not all about money, but as a CEO, Tim Cook has made more of it than Steve Jobs ever would have. So who made better products? I mean, some would argue that Steve made much better Apple products with more love and care put into each product line. And while I agree that Steve made better products for the few, 
Tim Cook makes better products for the many. Let's talk about the iPhone XR. The phone that was supposed to be depressing and insulting and would most certainly flop. As you know, if you're familiar with our show, I went on record almost half a year before we ever saw that phone, saying that it would be the best selling phone of the year, even before we knew what it looked like. I made my case for why I believed it was going to look almost exactly like the iPhone X's design, that people would be willing to buy that cheaper iPhone because it didn't look cheap. It looked like the new iPhone. And that's ultimately what separated it from attempts like the iPhone 5C and the iPhone SE. Compromise over innovation. You've heard me say it, and it's never been more obvious than it is right now. It's something I've been trying to tell you about the market for months, and you can't prove me wrong. Innovation is great, important, and needed for every industry, but you cannot force the wrong type of innovations, the effort in the wrong places, on a market that didn't ask for it or isn't ready for it yet. Consumers need to be met halfway. The answer to declining sales is compromise. If you want people to buy your products, make products for those people. The iPhone XR, would you say it's innovative? Probably not to most of you watching. Is the 828p display innovative? No. The single 12 megapixel camera on the back? Also no. What about the three gigabytes of RAM? <laughs> Absolutely not. But is it the best selling smartphone? Yes. The iPhone XR is the best phone on the market. Not because of specs or based on any of the metrics that you would probably use, but you, me, we really are disproportionately outnumbered by everybody else. The average everyday regular consumer. And no, it doesn't mean that they're dumb or that they don't know what they're buying. It means that they don't care to know what is on that spec sheet because their experience isn't reliant or determined by numbers on paper. And I know there's probably a ton of you right now shouting at me saying that just because it's the best selling phone doesn't mean it's the best phone, but yeah. That's exactly what it means. The iPhone XR is not the best phone for everyone, but according to sales, and we can't ignore this, it is the best phone for most people. In fact, if you look at the top three selling phones, they all have something in common, compromise. And Apple is finally learning from that. They're seeing that compromise is more valuable than innovation. And that's why this past Apple event matters so much. They absolutely littered the market with compromise. They have an iPhone option for almost every demographic on the market. Hell, the new iPhone 11 is $50 cheaper than the iPhone XR was. Moreover, the iPhone 8 and XR are also staying, not being discontinued. That's a major power play from Apple because now, to Apple, it's not about getting you on the new, the latest iPhone. It's just about making sure that the phone that you have in your pocket is an iPhone, period. They are deliberately and aggressively going after market share this year. They want old iPhone users to make an upgrade and they want to make a dent in the massive Android market share. Because now your relationship with Apple doesn't stop after you complete your transaction for your new iPhone. Now, more than ever, the iPhone is Apple's way to embed themselves even further into your life. Apple is making more money than ever in services, recurring revenue that allows them to keep profiting even more off of every device they sell to you. It's no longer just the App Store. It's Apple Music, iCloud, Apple News Plus, Apple Pay, Apple Care. I mean, they've even got you trapped with their own credit card at this point. More recently, we have Apple Arcade, Apple TV Plus, and way, way more. And the more of those things you use, the more the roots of the apple tree are embedded straight into your life. For the first time ever, Apple is willing to take a loss in exchange for market share. They're losing out on a ton of money by selling the new iPhone 11 for $50 less than they did 
with the 10R. They're losing by selling Apple Arcade for $4.99 a month and Apple TV Plus for $4.99 a month, even giving you a free year along with your purchase of a new Apple device. I mean, let's be real. Do you really think that Apple is going to charge $4.99 for these things forever? Hell no, eventually they'll charge $10 a month, $15 a month, but only after they've got you locked in. By taking a loss on some of these products and services, we are seeing Apple invest in themselves. They're investing in themselves in exchange for market share, something they've needed to do for a long time and something they probably wouldn't have done under Steve Jobs. Listen, I get it. It's fun and cool to say that Apple died when Steve died, but it's not true. Tim Cook has made Apple more money than they have ever seen, which in a publicly traded business makes him a better CEO than Steve Jobs. Not only has Tim Cook made them more money, he's also made Apple more active in front of the public, more transparent, and more willing to open up and play nice with others. Sure, the exclusivity that we have felt around having and owning Apple products might be a fond memory of the past, but it is not how Apple will thrive in the future. The landscape, the market is just different now, and it requires Apple to be a different company, to make products and decisions that benefit the many instead of the few. And that is why Apple is better off without Steve Jobs.